Join us now, ladies and gentlemen. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to Inside Baseball. Inside Baseball is our segment that we focus on an issue so much so that we lose almost everybody except you policy wonks. Today, our issue is North Korea. What in the heck is going on? My guest is Brad Glosserman. Brad, welcome. Thank you. Thank you also for putting the bat down. I was a little concerned. Well, we are talking about North Korea. There's a lot going on there. You and I have known each other for more than 30 years. Uh, a long time. A long time. Right. I first met you when we started our first diet door knock under the auspices of the American Chamber of Commerce. That's right. I remember you walking through the fountain in the lobby of the Okra Hotel. <laughs> Thanks for bringing that up. No charge. Erase that one. You're, you are doing a lot of things now. You're, you're at a, a university here in Tokyo. You're now ensconced here in Tokyo. You're making the rounds. You're having a couple of talks. Thank you for joining us on Tokyo on Fire. Great. What else here. are you doing? Well, I've moved back here October the 1st after 16, 17 years in Hawaii. I was running a think tank there. I still retain a position there as senior advisor at the Pacific Forum. But uh, now I am a visiting professor at the Tama University Center for Rulemaking Strategies, and that's my day get job. I read a lot of articles that you publish. You've got a, a new book that's in the works. You published a book last year. You are really turning it out. I'm on fire. Practice. Yes. These hands are, are, are scorched. Blessed by God. Yes. Well, or something. How in the heck did you get this, this access, this familiarity with North Korea that makes you such a popular hit on, uh, on talk shows like this? Uh, lies, deception, <laughs> um, the general exaggerations. Okay. And, 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 it uh, works. Well, actually, it's, it's, it's a fairly natural process. I was here for 10 years as a member of the editorial board of the Japan Times working on international affairs, uh, m you know, meeting people like you, hanging out in the international crowd, and then 17 years as a think tanker working precisely on regional security issues. Yeah. Um, and a, a part of those discussions were, you know, focusing on the strategic issues, the 35,000 foot questions of how we keep the region sta safe and stable. And among the folks that I got to meet and talk to were North Koreans. And so obviously if you're gonna talk about regional security and stability in a regional order, the North Koreans are a big part of that picture. So understanding right. North Korea and where it fits in is absolutely critical. Uh, the last time I saw you speak publicly, it was at Temple University and you gave a kind of a regional overview. It was really stunning and, and excellent uh, the way you integrated those things. Today I'd like to focus on North Korea and what's going on. There's so much going on. There's a, a meeting between the South Korean president and the North Korean leader to be followed by potentially uh, Mr. Trump and the North Korean leader, followed thereby perhaps with Mr. Abe, who knows? And don't forget you missed the meeting with Xi Jinping, the Chinese Supreme Leader, a few weeks ago. Right, so a lot is going on. What's the prognosis? Uh, it's, uh, you know, may you live in interesting times is a Chinese curse. I think mm -hmm. that's the best way to think of it. There's a lot of movement going on. I think this is all, however, been largely anticipated. I mean, if you were reading the tea leaves and looking at the developments, it was fairly easy to see what was coming. It's all been in train, frankly, since the beginning of the year when Kim Jong-un, the North Korean leader, made his New Year's speech where he's kind of extended a, 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 an olive branch to the South Koreans, basically saying, we want to join your Olympics. Mm -hmm. And yep. uh, the South Koreans were eager to have that opportunity, seized it. And that became a process of rapprochement. The conversations mm -hmm. began. You know, the things that the North Koreans want more than anything else is a dialogue with the United States, preferably one that acknowledges them as equals. And a photograph of Kim Jong-un and Donald Trump, a sitting United States president, unprecedented, will go a long way towards that. I think they'll get that, though. Oh, that's a, um, a, a lot can happen between now and then. I mean, I would say we're on the right trajectory. Mm -hmm. And I do think that symmetry is valuable. And I think meetings and diplomacy are good. Truthfully, I am not convinced that a meeting between Mr. Kim and Mr. Trump is in the best interests of, of both nations in the world, uh, and we can talk about that. But nonetheless, the more opportunities we have to, to talk to and begin to understand better and begin, if you will, create a, a larger diplomatic framework for engagement, I'm all for it. He went on TV just the other day and said, we are stopping our nuclear program. Uh, he said we're freezing our nuclear program, and I don't think it's that big a deal. Number one, he also said uh, back in October, November of last year that we've put an ICBM out with a, uh, a, a, a warhead on it. He said on Saturday we don't have to test anymore, so suspending a program when you've already said you've pretty much gone as far as you need to go uh, doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Uh, the nuclear test site is what they call a sick mountain, mm -hmm. and it, there's a danger of it collapsing and releasing all this radioactive gas, so there's some really questions about whether or not they could have conducted any tests there at all. Don't pay attention to the man behind the curtain. That's right. No, it's not, you know, just uh, take us at our word. Mm -hmm. And of course, all of the things that he, so he's, he's making promises that sound good mm -hmm. with uh, very little uh, 
that he's actually giving up. And that's a great place to be when you're beginning negotiations. Oh, no, I, I think that's okay, but there, there is a tip for a tat. I'm going to give up my nuclear program. I've, I find that very difficult to swallow, uh, but I'll do that, but you guys have to you know, denuclearize South Korea. I think that's a, a, a real. South Korea is denuclearized. I mean, that's the interesting piece of this puzzle. I mean, if, if and, and that's, I mean, that's really the magic question, mm -hmm. is what does denuclearization mean? Right. And, I mean, if you want to remove nuclear weapons from the Korean Peninsula, it's fairly easy. North Korea gets rid of theirs, because they're the only ones that exist. Mm -hmm. uh, if you wish to get rid of uh, nuclear energy, well, the North Koreans have a couple of plants, but they're really research reactors. They're not actually generating power. South Korea, President Moon has said, we want to get rid of it, so they're on the right path. Mm. Um, so it's not really clear why you've got a big problem here, unless, of course, perhaps the North Koreans mean something different by denuclearization than we do. And that, I have a pretty good feeling, is really what's going on. I think okay. what the North Koreans want is the elimination, if you will, of any nuclear capability or nuclear threat to them, which basically means then an end to the United States alliance with South Korea, the withdrawal of United States troops, perhaps the removal of the extended deterrent, not only over South Korea, but of Japan as well. Um, and so denuclearization in this context means considerably more than merely North Korea getting rid of its weapons. Right. There are some people that are saying President Trump will get the Nobel Prize if he can pull this sucker off. I think that's probably pretty accurate, but would, yeah. there's, a, there's a long lead time here, right? No, uh, um, that's one way to put it. I, I mean, it, sure, if he could denuclearize North Korea in the sense that you and I mean it, that, mm -hmm. that most people do, sure, he would deserve the Nobel Prize to the degree that he was responsible, and let's be very clear that there are a lot of people giving him credit for things that maybe, eh, maybe he doesn't deserve, mm -hmm. but yeah, uh, if, if they're prepared to let him to have the, to have it, then I, well, who should we, why are we to be churlish and deny that phone? Sure. But the question is, in fact, where will we, will we get there? And I think that there is, the, the larger issue and the more troubling one is to what degree is this president more concerned with A, doing the unprecedented, B, doing what he can't be told, what he's been told he cannot do, and C, striking a deal just to strike the deal mm -hmm. to make sure that he hasn't wasted his time and, and, and pulled something out of this hat. And then what will the content of that deal be? I mean, it could just be ultimately uh, you know, some sort of fig leaf. And if that's, a, if that's all it is, we can live with that. Maybe only, incremental steps, right. Oh, that's what, it, incremental steps is all there's going to be. We're not gonna wake up and discover, okay, here we go, everybody's ripping everything up and taking everything down and mm -hmm. turning it out. If you go back to those six party talks that were the multilateral negotiations that the Chinese hosted that began in 2003 and 2004 and lasted uh, roughly till 2008 or nine, they broke down before that. But I mean, the whole process then was, as they say, action words for words and action for actions. Right. It was always incremental. That's the only way we were mm. going to get anywhere. Trust but verify. Uh, even more than that. I mm -hmm. mean, uh, we don't even trust. No, we don't. No, but we definitely need to verify. And and that would require boots on the ground of, of some description. IAEA most likely. Right. Who, but, who would go through the tunnels, who would be checking out these these sites and testing the water? Well, doing uh, more than that, um, drinking the Kool-Aid perhaps. Um, I, I mean, if you go back to, in fact, the six-party talks, there was an agreement in 2005 to denuclearize the, 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 the peninsula, to, to, for North Korea to eliminate its nuclear program. Where that eventually collapsed was in the intervening year between 2005 when they made that statement, 2006 in September when they uh, tested their first nuclear device, was the failure of North Korea to put on the table and to actually identify all of their nuclear facilities in a way that the rest of the world could verify mm -hmm. in, in, a, in a genuine way what they had and to actually prove the, the, their commitment to the process. There are two issues that I see that are just uh, real sticking points. Number one, whatever they say, you can't trust it because they've, they, they've fallen back time and time again, they've made promises, they've received money, and then nothing happened. And the second, the second issue is the abductees. Uh, the second issue is an important one for the Japanese, but I'm, I mean, to be crude, I don't think anyone else much cares for the president's statements notwithstanding, and your comments in the previous segment notwithstanding mm -hmm. as well. Um, the fact is, I, I think uh, the big issue is the fact that the North Koreans have never honored an agreement that they struck since, two, since 1994, so 25 years of violations. Uh, and there've been a, a serial, a, a number of these. The, the larger question really, I think, is to what degree is there sufficient trust and sufficient capacity to build the foundation for a workable agreement? Uh, the fact is, is that the North Koreans don't trust the South Koreans. The fact is that the South Koreans don't trust the North Koreans. The North Koreans don't trust us. We don't trust them. Uh, the Chinese and the North Koreans don't like each other either. I mean, there, there's, there's, there's enough mistrust uh, uh, to go around. Mm -hmm. The primary issue, though, it seems to me, 
at the end of the day is is that North Korea needs these weapons to survive. Mm -hmm. That you know that North Korea is very much concerned that it has nothing else to compete with the South. That's counterintuitive. Uh, not why? Because it takes so much money to to do this, and it's it's not like they're building a market to sell these outside. They're just building this to protect themselves. And in the meantime, you know, it appears that the rest of the country is impoverished. Well, I, first of all, the suggestions are that the, the economy is getting better. I mean, Kim Jong-un has, has, has created what they call the Byungjin line, which is both the development of the military, which has been the policy of his father, and then the simultaneous development of the economy. The economists will tell you that while it is in sad, sad circumstances, in fact, the North Korean economy has is recovered in the last couple of years and doing better. It could do better than that, than it is. The problem is, at any degree, you know, the North Korea, if the con chief concern of the Kim regime is regime survival, not survival of the state, but the, uh, Kim right. staying on top the of, dynasty. The of the but dynasty, you can't afford to open it, you know, your doors too wide because that could erode your, your, your legitimacy. So the question then becomes, at what point does he have to really, you know, keep, if you will, society locked down? And at what point does that conflict with the dictates and the survival of the, or the flourishing of the economy? And I would, seems to me that if you've written the possession, your, your status as a nuclear weapon state into your constitution, you have a pretty hard time erasing that clause, especially when you just had it written in. Yeah. So across yeah. the board, it looks to me as though North Korea has made a calculation that it is not going to survive without its nuclear capabilities. And, and, forget, and, and this is a little abstract, but I think it's important. I mean, don't forget that there is a civil war that's going, that, that is still going on in, in Korea. And there is a competition between Pyongyang and Seoul as to who is the rightful leader, claimed to be the rightful real leader of the Korean people. North Korea has two possible claims for this. Number one, this Juche ideology, which is independence, which is a lot of hoo-ha, because they are, of course, dependent upon largesse from the rest of the world to survive. So independence is just sort of silly. And the second is their nuclear capabilities. Certainly, South Korea produces more economically in a single day than North Korea produces over a year. There is no way that in, under any other standard, North Korea can claim legitimately to compete. So this is, and, and, and you know, you and I may dismiss this as kind of being a bunch of silliness, but nevertheless, it is really important as a way to mobilize the people of North Korea, and in fact, certain parts, I mean, there are, let's face it, pockets of North Korean sympathizers in the South as well. And thus, the, North, the nuclear weapons are really key right. to keeping South, in that competition. Hard and, sell. Which part? It's a hard sell. I mean, if you're going to have a rapprochement with the, the United States, with Japan, with South Korea, to give up that that you hold most dear, it's really, um, it's, really it's, difficult. It's not only a hard sell. It's, I mean, you also have to remember that there are constituencies in North Korea that are bound up very closely to this nuclear program. That giving it up, it, it takes certain risk. And maybe, you know, don't forget too that Kim Jong-un, the, 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 the young marshal, is young, still relatively right. inexperienced yes. with all the people that he's killed. There's a lot of guys are in, in, that remain in the power structure that are suspicious of him and probably would just as be happy to see him brought down a peg or two, if not replaced. Where are these meetings gonna be held? Nobody knows. Okay, so it, that's kind of undecided, but it needs to be some neutral third place. Not necessarily. There's been some talk of it being in- The 38th? Pan, yeah, Pan and John. I mean, Mongolia is an option. Uh, Beijing, the Chinese would love to host it. Right. Uh, my Geneva is a possibility. Switzerland, maybe Sweden, but uh, nobody knows. But this is all gonna happen within the next three months, wouldn't you say? Mm, in theory, May or June. Right, so it's coming up. It's coming, but again, there's plenty that can go wrong. I mean, what will be interesting to see is what comes out of the South Korean meeting that, that's later this week. Uh, I mean, Kim has two, Kim Jong-un has two objectives. The first is his photo op with the president. That's his, the one thing his father and grandfather never got. Right. And that is him standing equal with the US president and him being able to turn to those people in the world and say, we're on equal status. Now, obviously I think he wants to be able, he wants to be accepted as a nuclear weapons state in theory, in the nuclear, I mean, I've been in conversations with North Koreans where they've said, we want to be treated like the Russians and the Soviets, and that's ain't gonna happen. My guess is they would settle for Pakistan, which is you know sort of a carve out on the NPT terms because they never signed. That's not gonna happen either. Um, but the, the, the second issue, I think, which is probably more realistic, and which is the real danger at this point, is the degree to which the South Koreans feel as though they're on the right diplomatic track and are more than inclined to engage with Pyongyang economically to weaken the international sanctions and, you know, if you will, loosen 
the, the, the pressures and reduce the pressures on the North that have pushed it, I think, into, into this negotiating posture. Because clearly that is an issue. And if the South Koreans defect, then you can count on the Chinese and the Russians to follow quickly as well. And if you do that, what you've really done is fractured the most important coalition, which is the United States, South Korea, and Japan. And that then, I think, changes the entire regional security dynamic. Right, what's your prognosis? If history's any guide, uh, it's not gonna go anywhere. Uh, as as uh, Victor Cha, a friend of mine and, and, and real expert on South Korea has said, you know, in Korea is, is uh, after every summit is, is, it comes a cliff. Uh-huh. Uh, and I think that's, it's a nice bumper sticker and we seem to live in an age of bumper stickers. Inside Baseball, where we discuss to death an issue of critical contemporary importance. We just finished talking about North Korea. Brad Glosserman as my guest. Thank you, Brad. Please stay tuned. He who breaks the rules goes back to the house of pain.